Great things are before us, and we want to call the people from their indifference to get ready. The ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper are two monumental pillars, one without and one within the church. Upon these ordinances, Christ has inscribed the name of the true God. Christ has made baptism the sign of entrance into his spiritual kingdom. He has made this a positive condition upon which all must comply who wish to be acknowledged as under the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before man can find a home in the church, before passing the threshold of God's spiritual kingdom, he is to receive the impress of the divine name, the Lord our righteousness. We are not now to cast away our confidence, but to have firm assurance, firmer than ever before. Let thy kingdom come. Our theme is thy kingdom come. And Andy kind of laid a good, gave a good message. We had a blessed message. We're talking about the entrance to that kingdom. And today I'm going to be talking about life in the kingdom of God. And so where possible, I'd like to invite those who are able to kneel with me. I'd like to invite the Lord's presence to be with us. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And Father, I pray that thy kingdom may enter each and every one of our hearts. I pray that thy words will find a place in our hearts today, that thou will give us ears to hear what thy spirit is saying unto the church. Father, I know that we have just had a meal and many of us may be a little tired. I pray that thou will give us quick minds, help us to be attentive and retentive, and I pray that thy holy angels will be with us to open our minds to understand wonderful things out of thy law. And I pray in a special way, Father, that will be with thy servant. May his words glorify thee. I pray that thou will be with my lips and give me the, the language of the wise and learned that I may know how to speak a, a word in season to them that are thirsty. And I pray, Father, that that will be with my words, that I may exalt and uplift to Jesus, that all minds may be drawn to him, that as he prayed, that if he be lifted up, he would draw all men unto him. That is my hope and prayer, that all things said and done will be to his honor and glory, and to ultimately to thy honor and glory. For this we ask in the blessed name of thy son, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> thy kingdom come. I know our opening text, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, talks about being crucified with Christ. But crucifixion is not my subject today. My subject matter is actually going to be dealing with the ordinance of communion. And you may be wondering in the back of your mind, well, what on earth does crucifixion have to do with communion? And my answer is everything. It has everything to do with it. I want to invite our minds back to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And those of you who have your Bibles, I invite you to open them together with me. I want us to note a couple things in this verse, very important. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, he says, I live. But it's not him that lived, was it? He says, nevertheless, I live, but not I, but who? Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live, how does he live? By the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We're talking about newness of life. With, when you talk about the crucifixion, there's always associated with it the resurrection. And we're going to notice that. Notice here the words of Jesus, or I should say a commentary upon the words of Jesus by the Apostle Paul. Paul says that I die how, or how often? Daily. Daily. So this crucifixion isn't a one-time thing, is it? Paul said that he died daily. And notice what he says just a, several verses later in verse 36. He says, That which thou sowest, speaking of seeds, 
is not quickened or made alive, except what? Except it die. So you see the connection between death and the resurrection. When you plant seeds in your garden, especially when you're looking at grain, that grain will not produce unless it dies. It has to die first. It, and Paul has commented upon the words of Jesus that except it die, it abideth alone. If it doesn't die, it abides alone. It produces no fruit. But God is glorified when we produce fruit. Amen? So before there can be new life in Christ, there has to be what? Death. Death. That's right. Except that seed die, there is no life. And notice Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. There the Apostle Paul says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He glorified in the cross. Now, that might seem like a difficult thought for many of us. Glorying in crucifixion. Glorying in a death such as the cross. But Paul said, God forbid that I should glory in anything save what? The cross of Jesus Christ. Now notice what he says. He says, by whom the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. Have you ever thought of that phrase? I know not too long ago it struck me. By whom I am crucified? Who crucifies me? Christ. That's right. By whom I am crucified to the world, or dead to the world, and by whom the world is crucified unto me. It's Christ that crucifies all worldliness in me, all desires for worldly gain, prosperity, advancement. It's Christ that crucifies that in me and crucifies me to all of that. And that's the subject matter of what I want to talk to us about today. And I want to note how Paul expresses it. He sums up what we've looked at thus far in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. I want to read them together with you. Paul says, What shall we say then? Ask the question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Dead to what? Dead to sin. Know ye not, he continues, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism. So we see what baptism is a symbol of. It represents the death, and death specifically to sin. Buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was also, excuse me, raised up from the dead, resurrected, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk, how? In newness of life. So the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is representation to us of newness of life. We are not to remain dead. Sin is to remain dead. But we are resurrected in newness of life, even the life of Christ. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, again, drawing upon the language of sowing, if we are planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, or we shall be also, in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be what? Destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. So he's saying the same thing over and over again. The crucifixion of sin is death to sin in us. But what does that mean practically? How do we die to sin? By ceasing to serve it. And in this very chapter, verse 16, Paul says that, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, 
to whom ye obey. So this is to teach us what it means to be dead to sin. He continues, verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Verse 8, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And this is to be our example. Paul is here trying to help us understand the significance of baptism. And if we want to understand not only the significance of baptism, but what is to follow baptism, we need to go back to the Old Testament and understand where or what system was replaced by communion. We learned this morning about uh, baptism. And anyone here know what system or what ordinance was replaced by baptism? Circumcision. Circumcision. That's right. It takes you back to the Old Testament. Baptism was a replacement for the ordinance of circumcision. And I want us to go back and look at what communion replaced in the Old Testament to help us understand what it is trying to be conveyed to us. If we go back to the Old Testament, we find that God put in place services. These services contained types, figures, that were a representation to us of things to come. They were a shadow of good things to come. They pointed forward to what Christ was going to do. And the, the entrance into the services, the entrance to be able to partake in these services, these yearly services, what we know today as the ceremonial law, entrance into that required circumcision. So as Andy was presenting to us this morning, we see that circumcision or baptism is the entrance into the plan of salvation. We are brought in. It is, is to use the words of Christ, our calling. Now we are told to make both our calling and our election or choosing sure. So not only we are to make our calling sure, but we are to make an election sure. For Jesus said, many are called. Many have entered into the plan of salvation by baptism, but how many are chosen? Few. Few are chosen. And we are told to make our election or our being chosen sure. And what I want to share with you today is to help us understand how we are to do that practically. I want us to look at this, these services, the sanctuary services, because they, they typify what Christ was going to do. They typify what we know today as the communion service. And anciently, God gave these services to help us understand what he wanted to do for us. The sanctuary service was instituted to teach us an important lesson. And that lesson is given to us in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. What did God want them to understand? Moses wrote, quoting the Lord, And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may, what? Dwell among them. What was the purpose of the sanctuary? That God may dwell among them. All the services of the sanctuary, all the feasts, with all its sacrifices, all its symbols and figures, were to help us understand how God would dwell with us. That's what those services were to teach us. How is it that God dwells with us? Well, what does the sanctuary service teach us? What is the main focus of the sanctuary service? It deals with sin. That's right. How sin is put away. You see, before God can dwell with us, sin has to be removed from us. Otherwise, we would be consumed. 
God is a consuming fire. And the sanctuary service was that God might dwell among his children, his people. And it was to teach us how sin is put away from the life. And these types have been transferred into the communion service. It's this lesson that, communi that the communion service teaches us, how sin is put away from the life. Notice also 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Helping us understand what the sanctuary represented in one sense. Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. What did that tabernacle represent? Well, ultimately, it represented Jesus. But it is also a representation of each and every one of us. God wants to dwell with us. Not simply in the same proximity, but he wants to dwell on our heart. And the sanctuary is to teach us how that is possible through the putting away of sin. And communion is to teach us this as well. Notice the language of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. There the prophet says, But your iniquities have what? Separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. What has brought separation? sin. And so you see, the sanctuary services that teach us how sin is removed, that we may be reunited with God. It's sin that separates us. It's our iniquities that has hid God's face from us. And God wants those to be removed, that he might dwell with us. But before we touch the communion service, there is something that transpired in the upper room before Jesus had uh, partaken of the Passover feast. Something happened. And I want us to look at that because it teaches us an important lesson. I want us to look at the ordinance of foot washing because it is intricately connected with the communion service. When we think of foot washing, we often think of washing, don't we? Symbolic of washing away the dirt and filth. But it has much more meaning than that. And I want to look at another aspect of foot washing for us. When you look at the ordinance of foot washing, it was a custom in the days of Christ. It was nothing strange or new that Jesus was doing to his disciples. Now those disciples, before they had gone up into the upper room, they had been involved in an argument. You may be familiar with this. But there was an argument among the disciples as to who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who was going to sit at Jesus' right hand and who at his left. And this had been going on for some time. And it grieved Jesus' heart. He longed to help them understand what heaven was all about. And so before he partook of the Passover feast, Jesus waited to see if one of them would begin to wash the feet. Because it was customary that the owner of the home would usually have, would do it himself or would have one of the servants wash the feet of his guests. But as they were in the home of another, that service devolved upon one of the disciples to, to do. And Jesus sat back and waited to see if one of the disciples would take up and fulfill that service. But none did. Because none of them wanted to be a servant. Every one of them wanted to be served. And Jesus, getting up, wanted to give them an object lesson that would never leave them. He got up from where the food was prepared, and he took off his outer garment, and he laid it aside. And the disciples were looking at him with shock. What is he doing? And he took a towel, and he girded himself with a towel. And he took a basin of water, which was used by the Jews for washing of hands and before they partook of their meal. 
And he took and he poured of that water into a basin. And then they knew what he was doing. And Jesus began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, foot washing means much more than just the cleansing of sin or, or the cleansing of the defilement of the way from a person. You see, before we can begin to partake of the communion service, something has to happen in the heart. And Jesus was trying to teach his disciples what has to happen in the human heart before we are fit to partake of the communion or of the Passover as they were preparing to do. Because communion was about to replace that feast of Passover forever. So Jesus begins to wash the disciples' feet. Now, why did Jesus do this? What was the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul, speaking to the Corinthians, says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. You see, foot washing is to help us understand what this unity means and how we are united. How we are united. The ordinance of foot washing is a service. It's a service that we render to our brethren. It's often called the ordinance of humility. That it requires us to play the part of a servant. To render service to another. And in this lesson, Jesus was trying to help us understand what heaven is all about. Heaven is not about being served. Heaven is about serving others. Jesus said, Ye have seen how that the great men of this world, how that they are great and they command others. But he says, In heaven it is not so. But those who would be great, they must learn to serve. For the Son of Man came not in this world to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In this, Jesus is trying to help us understand what heaven is all about. Heaven is about service. But none of his disciples were willing to serve. There was division among them. They were not of the same mind. They were not of the same spirit. They were not of the same judgment. And before they could understand and appreciate the Passover meal, and the communion service that Jesus was about to institute, they had to have that part of them crucified. Self had to die. They had to be willing to serve one another, willing to minister to one another. And this is what heaven is all about. It's what the sanctuary service was to teach us. And Christ was trying to instill that into the minds of his disciples. What greatness in the eyes of God is. For Jesus, the Son of God, came not to be served as some king or prince, but he came to serve others, to set an example for us that we may follow. Notice what Paul says in the second chapter of Philippians. Let's read verses 2 through 5. Paul, in a pleading tone, says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Going down to the last part of verse 3. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other, how? Better than themselves. Is that something that comes natural? No. It's something that strikes at the very heart of every one of us. Perhaps one of the hardest things to do, to esteem your brother better than yourself. We like others to esteem us better. 
We love to be appreciated, but heaven is about appreciating others, serving others. And that's what foot washing is to teach us. That is why we serve in washing feet before we partake of communion. It's to teach us how we are fit to have part in the kingdom of God. For unless that work is done in each of our hearts, we have no place in heaven. For all, for all of heaven delights in serving. The angels who excel in strength, before whom even one angel, 185, 5,000 men, died. Yet those angels delight to serve you and me. They are here now, ministering to us. And God wants us to understand what heaven is all about. And often we lose sight of it. And it's this service that is to bring it back to mind. To reinstill that brotherly love and kindness. The willingness to serve. To give of ourselves for one another. The, the apostle continues. Verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Being concerned for our brother's welfare, his things, his life, his circumstances. Do we rejoice with those who rejoice? Do we weep with those who weep? Are we as concerned for the things and the circumstances of our brother's life as we are for our own? That's what the service is to help us understand. Verse 5. This is the context of when Paul said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It was that mind that Jesus was trying to demonstrate to his disciples before the Passover feast. That joy Jesus wanted to be fulfilled in his disciples. He wanted them to know the joy of service of sacrificial giving, of giving of oneself. Greater love hath no man, said Jesus, than he lay down his life for his friend. And Jesus said, I call you my friends. That's the great love of heaven. Now we come to the communion feast. After Jesus had washed the disciples' feet, then they all sat down in preparation for partaking of the Passover meal. And at this meal, Jesus instituted what we know today as communion. But anciently, it was the Passover meal. In John chapter 6, Jesus helps us to understand what is being prefigured in the communion feast. What the wine or grape juice represented and what the bread represented. Its significance. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 57, I live by the Father. So he that eateth me shall what? Shall live by me. Man shall not live by bread alone. But how? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's why in verse 63 of the same chapter, Jesus says, It is the spirit that quickeneth. My words are spirit, and they are life. What is it that Jesus was speaking of when he said eating his flesh and drinking his blood? His words. His mind. Amen. We are to become in one mind with Christ. And this is what the communion is to teach us. How does God dwell among us? How does God dwell in us? That's what this service is to teach us. When we partake of that bread and that wine, we are partaking of Jesus. We are symbolically consuming his flesh and his blood, taking his life in us. Notice also in John's first epistle, chapter 1, verse 3, notice the connection. John says, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have what? Fellowship. fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. What does fellowship mean? 
What's another word for fellowship? Communion. You see, God wants to have communion with us. Not simply communion one with another, but it's God who wants to commune with us. Revelation 18, verse 4, speaks of the same language, but in a different connotation. Speaking of Babylon, the Apostle John says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be what? Not partakers of her sins. Just as we partake of the bread and of the wine, in this same way we partake of the sins of the world. For if we become partakers of the sins of Babylon, we shall also receive of her plagues. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Same word that is translated communion. Peter says this, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, the promises, and we saw one of the promises that Jesus made earlier today regarding baptism, that by these, these precious promises, ye might be what? Partakers of the divine nature. How is it that we become a partaker of the divine nature? Nature? Through the promises, through his word. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How is it that we escape the corruption that is in this world? By fellowship with God, through his word. As we spend time in that word, the mind of God is indelibly fixed or etched upon our own mind. His words become our words. His thoughts become our thoughts. No longer do we think the thoughts of the world, but we begin to think the thoughts of God as we partake of his word. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29. Paul says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. There are those that eat and drink unworthily. Now, this is used in reference to the communion service, but it also applies to the Word of God. Because the communion, the eating of the flesh and of the blood of Christ is symbolic or representation of eating of Christ's words. And there are many that eat of those words unworthily. They eat in the wrong spirit. They eat with the wrong motive. Maybe it's to prove themselves right. To prove their church right. To prove some doctrine to win some argument, whatever the motive may be. There are many that eat of the body and blood of Christ unworthily. And those, said Paul, eat and drink to themselves what? Damnation. Why? He tells us, because they do not discern in these things the body of Christ. They don't discern that these things are emblems of God. They don't discern holy things. Just as the swine, Jesus said, do not cast your pearl before the swine. Does a pig value pearls? No. To him they mean nothing. So he'll trample them underfoot. So it is with many in the word of God. They do not discern in the word of God its holy nature. That these are the expression of the very mind of God. They are sacred things. When we partake of sacred things, we are to do it worthily, having in mind that these are the thoughts of God. These are the words of God. And the Lord wants us to have a discernment when we partake of the communion service, to understand the sacredness of this ordinance 
just as it was sacred to the children of Israel when they wandered in the wilderness and when they came into the land of Canaan. And during the Passover feast, all these feasts were to be to them a reminder of the sacredness of the work of God. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. Again, this same word is used. I want us to understand in this, I want to address the question or the aspect of communion service. Because there is among us a question as to whether the communion service should be open or closed. I don't know, maybe some of you uh, have never had or learned or heard of this argument, but there has been an ongoing debate for many years now as to whether this service, which was to take the place of Passover, is open or closed. And I want to share a few thoughts from the Word of God to help us understand how the, uh, the authors of the Bible understood it and how Christians down through the ages have understood this service, how it should be kept. And so with that in mind, I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. There the Apostle Paul writes, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this word fellowship is the very same word that is translated communion in reference to the ordinance that Christ instituted. It's the very same word. We have been called unto the communion of the Son of God. Now who has been called and for whom is this service intended? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. And I don't have all of those verses up here. I do want to read them all, though. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. The apostle says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion, again the same word, and what communion hath light with darkness? Verse 15. And what conquered hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Are you seeing the point that Paul is making? What communion does faith have with unbelief? What communion does Christ have with the devil? What communion does light have with darkness? None, right? There is no communion between them. He continues, verse 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye what? Separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So this fellowship, this communion we have, is it with unbelievers? No, it is not. It's not with darkness. It's not with error. We don't have communion with idols. The communion is reserved for, for a specific class, those who have been called. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul expresses this fellowship in language that is interesting. He says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship, again, same word, translated communion, to make all men see what is the fellowship or communion of the what? mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. 
This communion we have, this fellowship we have, those of like faith, is called a mystery. In Colossians 1.27, Paul calls it a mystery among the Gentiles. It was a mystery to them. They had no part in it. The world has no part in this communion. It is a communion for the body of Christ. You see that in the Passover feast. You see it in the communion instituted by Jesus. It was a service designed by Christ specifically for his church in which none other could have a part. No infidel could have a part in this because they have no part in Christ. Because it is not the communion of what we would say friendship or fellowship. It is the communion of Christ. It is union with him. We are joined with him in baptism. And that's what this feast is to teach us. Because when they partake of that bread and they partake of that wine, it was symbolic of taking the mind of Christ. They were coming into one mind. The same blood would be flowing in their veins that was flowing in the veins of their fellow Christian. Because they were partaking of the same blood. They were partaking of the same bread. It was a symbolic representation that they were no longer to be divided. They had become one, and they were one in him. They were partaking of his body, of his blood. It was that that was to unite them. They were to be of the same mind, one with another. And this service was to teach us that. It was a mystery. And from the time of the apostles down until the very first part of the 20th century, communion was closed. It always had been closed, communion. It's not until very recently that the communion service has been opened up to the world. And when you look at the condition of the church today, you begin to see the result of that. When you begin to bring in unworthy into the body of Christ, into that communion. It destroys, the, it destroys the figure. It's a pollution of the body of Christ. It's a pollution of the blood of Christ. No unbeliever can have that fellowship. No worldling can have that communion that we have. Not even my blood brother, who is an unbeliever, has the fellowship that I have with all of you. Because he is not of this body. As much as I love him, he has no part in it. And Andy talked about the entrance into that body this morning in dealing with baptism. But communion is all about the newness of life, resurrection from the dead, partaking of the mind and spirit, the words of Christ. We are to be born again. It is all about fitting us for the kingdom of heaven. The communion is to teach us what is required of us to enter into the, into the kingdom. And Brother Bill, in just a little bit, is going to be sharing with us the purpose of the communion. It's to fit us and prepare us for that great day that is upon us, the glorious appearing of Christ. And that is why the apostle admonished us, uh, admonished us that it, as oft as we eat this, we do remember the death of Christ until he come. It's to be a remembrance. It's to bring us together how the prayer of Christ, that they might be one, even as we are one, is to be filled in us. And I want us to go away from here having a new perception, a new appreciation 
of the communion service, what it means to partake of this bread and of this grape juice. I don't want us to partake of it unworthily, but I want us to discern in it the body of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ. Every time we open the Word of God, we have, as it were, a personal audience with God. We enter into His audience chamber. We are, in a sense, partaking of the body and blood of Jesus. And the communion service is to be a special time of that communion. It's to be a drawing together of God's people. We are called the body of Christ. Have you ever wondered what would happen if your hand refused to serve? If your foot refused to serve? If your eyes decided they would no longer serve the body? Where would we be? God has fearfully and wonderfully made us. He's made us an object lesson to help us understand what heaven is all about, what the communion service is to teach us. As we become of the, a part of the body of Christ, we are to understand what service is, that we are here to serve one another, just as every cell in my body serves the cell beside it. Every member of my body serves my whole body for the good of the whole. And that is the lesson of communion. God will have a people who are one mind and who are one spirit. But it won't come without sacrifice. Self must be crucified. Pride must be washed away. God is waiting for a people who are willing and ready to be sealed, to receive the name of God in their foreheads, who perfectly represent his Son. The universe is waiting. The angels are waiting. Heaven is waiting for us. And what will we do? Is it your desire to be a part of that kingdom? Amen. To be fit for that kingdom? Then shall we kneel in a word of prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, Father, I thank thee for thy wondrous love. I thank thee for the service that was instituted by thy Son, this precious communion service instituted to teach us what heaven is all about, to help us understand what it means to be a partaker of the divine nature. And Father, I pray that each and every heart and mind here will not go away the same, that we will not leave this place today the same as when we came. But I pray a work will be done in each and every one of our hearts, that thou will place in each and every one of us a desire to be one, not only with our brother, but with thee. That we, Father, may desire to partake of the body and blood of Jesus, to be of one mind and of one spirit, that that love that flowed through the veins of Jesus that desire to sacrifice and to give of himself for the well-being of a fallen world, of those who did not love him, that that same love may flow through our veins, that we, Father, may be, as it were, thy hands upon earth to minister unto the sin-sick and the weary, unto those who are oppressed, unto those who are longing for something better. Father, I pray that we might be truly 
thy body here upon earth to minister unto this world in sickness and sin, that they may see in us a oneness, a love, and a fellowship, that they may desire. I pray that we may be to this world as it were a gazing stock, that we might be an example of what heaven is, that those who come in contact with us may receive a taste of what heaven is to be, that it may be said of us as it was said of the, the disciples, that truly they have been with Jesus. Father, bless us now as we close. I pray thy spirit and presence continue with us. Prepare our, our minds and hearts for the message that is to come. And Father, I thank thee once again for thy great love toward us. May we always be mindful of what thou hast done for us, that we too may be willing to do for others. We bless thee and thank thee, and do ask all of these things in the name of thy dear Son, Jesus. Amen. Let thy kingdom come. If you would like more information or have questions on the topics in this series, please contact us at info at phm.org.